I told you when I went over whole water, whole water, whole plant water relations, that then we'd go over the physics and then we'd come back and talk about uh, these different aspects. And and the thing we want to talk about now is root pressure. And I don't know if I've told you, and I'll send an email out. There will not be a class on the Friday before spring break. I, I know I mentioned that, but I probably didn't actually state that. Um, several year, years ago, about five students came up to my office and said, you know, if we didn't have to go to class on that Friday, I could say we could all save several hundred dollars on our plane ticket. I said, okay, well, no problem. So there won't be class, but you will have a bit of the book to read about osmoregulation. We're going to talk a little bit about it today. And uh, there's, there's a small bit in the book. There's like four pages, I think. Um, so now we want to come back to this. And what we're looking at here is a osmometer. And what we're looking at here is a root. This is, the how, this is how a root works. So if you look at this... Uh, diagram, you have water flowing in, and you see the column of water moving up. Above the level of the water, right here, obviously, and it's moving up because where's the higher concentration of water? The blue, the outside. So the white is a lower concentration of water. So uh, the plant inside the root is not water. It's a lot of water, but it's a lot of all, all sorts of soluble compounds. So water is continuously moving in, and that column will move up until the point of where what pulls it down? Gravity. Okay. Otherwise, it would just keep moving up, right? And I've looked, and I've, I've wondered if they've ever done this experiment on one of the shuttle missions. Because that should just move. It, it's, there's still a little bit of gravity, but it should move on up. I, I've, I've looked. I know at one point when, they, when the shuttle first was introduced and NASA was desperately trying to come up with reasons to use it, that NASA actually had an uh, office here on campus to help people come up with reasons to use the shuttle. And not someone here, but someone somewhere had, had just wanted to do this experiment. And so I'm, I, I can't find it on YouTube or anywhere, so I don't know if it ever got done. Uh, so now why then is the root an osmometer? Let's go back and let's talk about the fact that we have this very highly structured root and that when we go from the outside in, that we have this layer of cells called the endodermis. And the endodermis waterproofs the cell walls. Okay? So until this point, and I'll, I'm gonna, I will also give you a couple of uh, terms that you're going to need to know. We have water moving in the cell, between the cell, in the cell. But when it gets to this point, then water can only, I'm trying to do a perspective again, move through the cell. In other words, water must move through a membrane to get into the center. So. That's why a root is an osmometer. And why an osmometer is a good representation of a root. So you have water moving in. And so it can get pretty hairy out here because you can calculate the water potential uh, in the uh, symplast, which is one of the terms I'll give you to learn. and. Apoplast, and apoplast means between the cells. Symplast means in, inside the cells until they get to this point. So you can go out here and get some pretty hairy calculations for water potential. 
But if we go, but if we go back one, then this is what we're looking at here. Just basically the water potential of the soil and then the water potential of the steel, the root, the xylem, basically the inside part of the root, inside the endoderma, well, inside the pericycle actually, okay? So uh, that waterproofing level, uh, layer is on the sides and tops and bottoms. So the water has to move through the cell and we generate this root pressure then, okay? And I told you that one of your questions on your second take-home exam would be about gutation. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here. And I think... And, and uh, this, this last one, you can, this is, you can literally do this. You can carefully cut the top off of some plants and put a... Uh, connection onto the plants and you can then actually measure how much pressure is moving up. Remember that pressure pushes the water up to a degree. And you've also got transpiration pulling water from the other end. Okay? Questions before we go on? Yeah, this is one I want to start on. Okay, now, we're going to go over some classic work, probably the first major experimental work done with plants, uh, which is to determine what minerals plants need and how much they need. Because if you think about it, when you didn't have any equipment or very little equipment and we got to the point of where we knew we could separate out compounds so we could get nitrogen sources and zinc and all that kind of stuff then these were experiments that could really be done and uh, we're going to go over uh, some of that today and then the next lecture we'll go over the, the biochemistry of, of movement now, there's a lot of uh, objectives. Um, we'll talk a little bit there at the bottom about mycorrhizae, just a little bit. There are some anti-nutrients. There are essential nutrients that plants need. There are macronutrients, which that means the plant needs a lot of them. There are micronutrients, which plants need a little of them, and in fact, Sometimes the only way you can see a micronutrient deficiency is in a plant is to grow the plant without that nutrient to maturity, harvest the seeds, grow the plant again from those seeds from that deficient nutrient, and then maybe grow them in third generation. So what is a micronutrient and what is required and not required by plants sort of seesaws back and forth because you can't grow the plants in glass because you've got some stuff that's going to come out of the glass. Uh, you can't have dust in the greenhouse. For some micronutrients, the dust is enough to make the plants needs. So you're probably never going to see a micronutrient deficiency. Well, you might see some, but it's hard to actually determine. So you'll see some list of required nutrients and required, well, required macronutrients, which those are pretty easy. Then you'll have, see the list of micronutrients and sometimes you'll see, com, uh, you'll see elements going in and out of the list, you know, when we get down to the bottom. Um, <clears throat> okay, first thing, what are we talking about? You guys know what's ever heard of C. Hopkins? 
the list of required elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? And you may have heard of C. Hopkins Cafe, which includes calcium and iron, which are two other elements that are usually needed. And the, for all life, it is C. Hopkins Cafe managed by my cousin Mona Cliff Cosi. And that's, SI would be selenium. That's everything that's required for life in all organisms. So including plants, bacteria, and animals. So it's an easy way of remembering all that useless information. So these are things we're not going to be talking about exactly, but hydrogen is extremely important because a lot of times when an ion moves in, a hydrogen moves out. We're going to see that when we talk about transport. Guess what? Most minerals are carried in by transport proteins. So they have a, they have a KM and they have a Vmax, just like an enzyme does. Very little of anything gets into a plant without being without being carried by a protein so the plant can better regulate these things are obviously not inorganic and here's something that I like to start off with so uh, these are classic pictures made in the 40s and some of the best work that was done until MAT down O and the point is never ever memorize mineral deficiencies because you're going to look them up and it's really stupid to memorize them because you could be wrong remember incorrectly and screw up a crop and if you're actually growing something you're going to have pictures of that crop you're not you know you're not going to be out in the middle of nowhere and you're going to have things you can look up and here you see this is uh, this is uh, the point of this slide was to point out that in the case of this deficiency it looks different in different plants and so when when you when you learn the mineral nutrition deficiencies that's a mythical plant that does not exist and there's so much that you have to take into account you know we talked about calcium deficiency in blossom in rot and tomato well if I see a tomato like that I'm pretty sure that's a calcium deficiency but it also is going to take into account how fast the water is moving into the plant uh, the temperature so you when you do these things you 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 have to use all the knowledge that you have you know, and sometimes nitrogen deficiency doesn't look like nitrogen deficiency. There are some classic beans where they can look nitrogen deficient through the fourth, fifth, sixth. So you have five or six of leaves that are yellow. And if you don't know what you're doing, you come in and you side dress with nitrogen, and now you've got nitrogen toxicity. You know, oh, I must have not had any, when I, you know, when I fertilized I must not have fertilized this plot or I didn't put the night you know whatever and so you fertilize more and boom the plants are dead so you know if you're out in the real world you're going to be growing a crop or you're going to be growing something in the greenhouse and you're going to be maybe growing 20 different things but the point is you're going to be able to get all sorts of information you're going to get a bulletin on how to grow geraniums and it's going to tell you which mineral nutrition deficiencies you're going to run into first and then you just look it up okay so you know I'm probably only this is probably the only plant physics course in the country that doesn't require you to memorize this stuff you can look it up now deficiency symptoms here this is boron boron is one of the weird ones um, it's hard to get bor it's hard to produce reagent grade boron deficiency in the green in the lab in under experimental conditions because boron's pretty well a lot of different places. But the point here is you can see celery stem cracked, cauliflower leaves curled, hollow stem, clover, poor stands. Well what does that mean, poor stands? I mean, 
What if you haven't watered in the last two weeks? You know. So um, the whole point is, no matter what you end up doing, if it involves plants, then uh, you're, you're not going to go out without any sort of information. And uh, last night we went out some of the former students that are in the wine industry now. And they were actually talking about, they remembered me telling them not to memorize this stuff because now with grapes, they know exactly what the deficiencies are going to look like in grapes because that's all they do. And they only do grapes in Texas. And then they only do mostly grapes in the hill country. So, yeah, they know what the deficiencies are because of experience. And the person before them telling them, this is what this looks like. So... I, I can't hammer it home because, I, and the reason why I do it, I don't remember anything. So if you think you know, if you think you're, you know, if you don't remember correctly, then you're in trouble. You know, it's like, it's like when people work in my lab, you know, and I have undergraduate student projects, you have to write down everything. If you multiply 10 by 10, you have to write down 10 times 10 equals 100 because 99% of the mistakes you make are math errors and you're off by a decimal point because you're doing it in your head and you're, and you're doing 10 different things and you go 10 times 10 equals 1,000 if you do it in your head and you just don't think about it, okay? So write everything down. So how do we sample? Well, guess what? Depends on what you're growing. Patio samples are probably the most common. And if you think about it, uh, there's not many crops where you can't send off a sample to be analyzed way before you'd have to worry about deficiencies. And you can send those samples to commercial labs. There's a lab on campus. Uh, they will actually tell you exactly what to sample, where to sample, how many to sample, uh, to give you good information. Why? Because countless people have done countless experiments on different crops. And so they'll know that, oh, if you've got this, in this petio analysis, you're, you're okay. You might be a little low in zinc, whatever. But even with that, you've got to know the condition. So, if we're like in a California, well, a Texas drought, then a lot of times the deficiencies are really due to the fact that there's just not enough water around. But anyway, you can get sampling guides. Uh, here it tells you what to take. Asparagus, entire above ground portion of plant. Uh, celery, entire ground portion. Let's see, we'll find something that's not. Entire ground portion. To have no one know. These are mostly. Oh, here they are. Seedling stage versus vegetative. So you know, depends on when you're going to do it. And this is what you're going to get back from most companies. What they'll, you know, you send your sample in. They have a pretty quick turnaround. It's all computerized. Uh, you fill out some information about your sample, and they send you back this neat little uh, graph. So Green is cool, uh, yellow high, yellow low, so you can very quickly look at that and decide what you need to do, if you need to do anything. And again, the longer you're doing something, the more you're going to know what the plant needs before it needs it. Just, just experience, right? So. Most of them now, they, you get this, this, you know, this of course is now done. Uh, most places, they, uh, they do it, send you a link, and so you don't even have to wait to get this analysis back. You just go to the link and see what the analysis is. And part of good production practices is doing soil analysis and also doing plant analysis. That's just, that's just good practices. You don't wait till the plant turns yellow to decide what's wrong with it. You have to try to keep up with what's going to happen. Okay. And uh, 
And then usually, I'm trying to think of some other companies, you get this for a certain cost, then if you want comments from agronomist Scott Anderson, um, you may get the canned comments, and then if you want to actually talk to this person, he's available. And sometimes there's actually like a second tier fee for talking to the guy. Usually not, depends on the company. Questions? This, you know, anybody, any of you ever done this? Did you get this kind of graph back? Yeah, it's pretty, what were you growing? Tomatoes. Growing tomatoes, okay. Uh, hydroponically or in the, in the ground? In the ground, okay. What did you sample, patios or all oh, patios? Okay, and that's because for tomatoes, then they've worked through what, they're, what you're gonna find in the patio that's gonna reflect how the crop's gonna grow. Okay. Okay, this is something that, um, and I, I don't know if I've sent this out to you yet, this is one of the better deficiency keys. Do you guys, have you guys used the dichotomous key to do anything? Okay, right, upper leaves versus lower leaves. Um, we will be talking about mobile and non-mobile minerals. Nitrogen is a mobile mineral, so if the if a nitrogen deficiency occurs, the plant's number one goal is to produce seed, to survive, to go to the next generation. So you'll see the lower leaves turn yellow because the plant is mining the nitrogen from the amino acids, from, from the proteins to convert into amino acids, and those can be moved into the upper part of the plant, and the plant then stays green. Okay? There are other elements that once they are incorporated into the plant, they cannot ever move again. And in that case, you're going to see the bottom of the plant, the older leaves are green, and then the young growing tips are yellow or purple or whatever else. Okay? This is a page, so what you do, and this is a really good one. First of all, you do need to know the terms on the left here. It's vital that you know these terms. And that you be able to identify what modeling is. So, because if you don't know the terminology, you can't use the key, and if you don't know the terminology, you can't call up the extension guy and tell him what's going on. Now, of course, that's not that big of a deal, because what do you do now? Do I? Pull your phone out, take a picture, and send it. But these terms are still important. The difference between necrosis and uh, chlorosis, burning, Immobile, we just talked about that, we'll talk about that more. Stunting, so these are sort of like the vocabulary that nutrient people use. And each of these have a very specific meaning. Uh, and so you do need to know those. And then on the right, we've just got this dichotomous key. Uh, older or lower leaves affected? Yes, then we go down the pathway here to the next point. Affects mostly generalized, plants dark or light green, yes. Plants dark green often develop purple or red color, yes, well, that could be phosphorus. A classic symptom of phosphorus deficiency is a purple color. But it could also be all sorts of other things, too. So this is a pre pretty good key uh, for you to use. Here's just the rest of it. This, again, is for that mythical plant that may or may not exist. Now, plants have to take in everything. They take in water. They take in minerals. They take in carbon. They are what's called autotrophic which means they do not have to grow in sugar or carbon. And so we break down the kind of nutrition that we talk about in terms of first organic, of course, and that is fixing CO2 into 
sucrose. And then what we're talking about today is minerals, uh, mineral nutrition. And uh, that's very important. And again, it was easy to work on when we didn't have anything else to use. And it was also very important. So, uh, what if, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of nutrition. And um, When I was in college, I actually, I, I minored in environmental geology and the environment. I had two minors. I had a, a, a minor called The Environment. And there was a really famous book called Limits to Growth by Paul Ehrlich. And so in the, came, the came, book probably came out in 70 or so. And his data showed that we, the, the world would not survive another 20 years. The population was growing too fast. It was going to be impossible to produce enough food. Uh, and there's been one of these kind of, and, and, you know, and it was good science. It just you know, did not take into account increases in production, new methods. And that's been the story since civilization started. There's always been some radical increase in technology, you know, that puts that limits to growth off for another X amount of time. And Malthus was the first person to talk about this a long, long time ago, given, you know, our production this is how many people we can, the, the, the world can survive, or can survive, okay? Uh, so, the really big breakthrough occurred at the end of the last century, maybe even after 1900. Um, the first thing was the development of phosphorus fertilizers. Before this time, and let me see, I think I took that slide out. Okay, before this time, you use manures. And almost all nitrogen came from guano caves in South America. That was the world's source of nitrogen, was bat guano. Another source was uh, mummified cats from e Egypt. When the Egyptians mummified the people, they also mummified an enormous number of cats. S enough so that there was an industry that would take these mummified cats, grind them up, and ship them to England for fertilizer. This was a business. This was an industry. This is where England got most of their nitrogen from, these two sources, you know. And then the big breakthrough was the Haber process, where for the first time ever, we could produce a synthesized, very cheap to produce nitrogen. That was the big breakthrough, chemical fertilizer. Anybody know who ever heard of Haber? You know what else he invented? Mustard gas. He uh, actually he was a he was a colleague of Albert Einstein, and instead of, and Einstein of course was a pacifist. Well, Haber did everything he could do to help the Germans, and so his contribution was chemical warfare. And he went on to bigger and nastier things after that. So people, you know, think about him with nitrogen. No, he also, he came up, he, he presented the idea of chemical, of gas warfare to the German army. They didn't come to him. He went to them and said, hey, you know what? I think I can kill a lot of people. You know, so, so when you think about Haber, think about that also. <laughs> now, 
So how did we do these experiments back in the late, not last century, the early 1900s or whatever? Well, the first thing we did is get rid of the soil. Soil screws everything up. Soil holds minerals, won't let them go. So the first thing we did is grow plants in water. So all the classic experiments are in hydroponics. And Dr. Drew, who used to teach the class with me, um, worked in the laboratory. And Dr. Drew, um, he's now living in the south of France. Uh, he, he was in the Blitz in World War II. And so when he moved to Davis, they were actually doing these experiments. So they had all these incredibly expensive glass houses that were sealed so that dust literally couldn't blow around. And they were developing these different mineral solutions to grow plants in. And so there was, some, there was a point where they were even wearing respirators so they would not add CO2 to the greenhouse. They didn't want the confounding problem of higher CO2 interfering with looking at the mineral deficiencies. So that's pretty sophisticated for you know, the late 40s, early 50s. So the first thing is try to figure out what a plant needs to survive. Now think about that. That's hard. How do you do that? Well, you've got analysis. They could do chemical analysis of plants. So they knew what was in plants, you know, at least the macronutrients. So you start making all these solutions with different combinations of things. And so pretty fast you realize, whoa, the plant needs a lot of nitrogen. And then the plant needs a lot of this and of that, and then lesser amounts. So it's not an easy experiment to do. And here was one of the first uh, complete nutrient media that, were, that was developed. Potassium nitrate, we've got potassium and we've got nitrogen. We've got phosphate, we've got some calcium. We've got magnesium, maybe we need sulfate. We've got another source of calcium. We need sodium and chloride, and of course we need iron. And probably what's the number one thing that iron is used for in a plant? We'll talk about it later. Anybody know? Iron deficiency? Probably the most, imp well, I mean, it's not like one thing is more important than the other. But the porphyrin ring that, um, that, is, that is required for chlorophyll to work is held together by an iron molecule, or an iron atom. So, for it to have the, the correct three-dimensional structure, it has to have an iron atom in it. So no iron, no photosynthesis, which is not good. <clears throat> Finally they went through and what we use now is, and we used, we used to do all our work we did was in hydroponics. We grew, we grew corn to about a week old in gallon glass jugs and we used a Hoagland solution. Hoagland's or a modified Hoagland solution is sort of like the standard thing that you make up if you're going to grow plants for research in hydroponics. And just, if, and just to give you an idea, these, this is not just one solution. You have some uh, stock solutions that you use to make up the larger volume. And you have to be real careful. If you add things in the wrong order, they'll precipitate out. No big deal. You just have a little recipe that you follow. And uh, it's pretty stable. As long as you keep it under low light conditions, it won't turn green. That's the problem with hydroponics is algae growing, okay? And here's uh, what they came up with more or less. And these are not individual solutions. You can make groups of these. I don't know what the groups are. Um, we're getting out of uh, molybdenum. And then we have a source of iron that's easily taken up by the plants. And back to hydroponics, the problem that we have with hydroponics is we're growing plants in a deep level of liquid. Like if it's a gallon jar, the, the plantlets, the seedlings are 
in a little styrofoam boat and the roots are growing down into the water, which means we have to add oxygen. So it has to be aerated. Okay. Uh, you don't see a lot of true hydroponic commercial setups. So you don't see a lot of setups where there's, let's say, a foot of water the plants are growing in. And if you do, they have to have independent air sources. So you can't just hook up one air rate, you know, one aquarium pump or a couple of, uh, one aquarium pump to your system because if the aquarium pump goes out and you don't catch it and it's a warm day, the plant goes anoxic, which means no oxygen, and it dies. The root stop, stops transporting things into the root. The root cannot produce ATP. So very quickly, the plant dies. So if you do even hydroponic, and there are people that, we have students who have hydroponic systems at home. They'll have at least two, and hopefully even more, air sources, independent air sources. So three aquarium pumps. Okay. You have to worry about light. So most of the time you'll see like, well, we would use, we, we're, if we were growing plants past, we were usually growing corn to about that high before we were just interested in the root tips. But if we were going to go a little bit longer, then we had, we wrapped the, the jugs in aluminum foil. So that we have to, we would cut down on the algae growing. The problem with algae is algae is plant. So if you kill the algae, you kill the plant. You know, so you can control algae in a um, aquarium much easier than you can control algae in a system where terrestrial plants are growing. And you've got to support them. And here's. Uh, a setup that, that is used. Um, you have a tube going in here. Uh, in this case, this, this top here is actually closed. And this was done so that nothing could just sort of fall into the container. So you have pretty much a closed system. You have a, the top is closed off. You have aeration coming in. And then you have actual funnel where you can add uh, more solution. Now also, you think about something here. When you're, when you're in the greenhouse with this thing, what's happening up here? Transpiration. Transpiration. So the concentration of water is decreasing. Probably at a different rate at which the minerals are being transported into the plant. So you have to change the solution if you're doing reagent grade experiments. So you can not only just, you have to keep replacing it with fresh solution minus nitrogen, or fresh solution minus calcium. Because it depends on how the plant's growing. But in all probability, it's losing water faster than it's losing minerals from the solution. Now, if it's, you're growing it for production or whatever, that's a consideration, but it's not that important. So what I'm talking about now here is reagent grade control. I'm trying to figure out if plants need molybdenum. Okay. So here are some alternatives that we're going to talk about real quick. Uh, I think nutrient probably is the one that, if you're going to use any kind of hydro hydroponic system, is probably the best. Uh, we have this system, and this is this is um, this can be more than one system. These are very popular, uh, where you have water pumping in here. But the fact that it's not at a high level, and usually you do have some aeration down here in the uh, collection vessel, and the water is just pumped through here. And you can see um, this in uh, HEB used to have a, you see the lettuce that you get that's in the little plastic container? You, know, you get the whole, full head of lettuce, and it still has the roots attached to it. That's grown into one of these. This is, there's, it's very, there's very little between, difference between a slope system and a nutrient film system. HEB south, we're on NASA Road 1, there's a huge HEB down there. 
if you've ever seen it, has a huge glass atrium in the front. They used to produce um, lettuce in there. So they just had a, a, just a, a, a high number of PVC pipes where they grew the lettuce, and when the lettuce would get mature, they'd just literally put it in the plastic and sell it. It just wasn't cost effective to do it. I mean, it was, you, you, they couldn't do that in the store to be cost effective. One that's becoming more popular now for production is Albin Flow, where you have your plants in pots and they're in a container and you flood that container so the water goes up into the plant and then you drain the, the nutrient solution out so you don't have to worry about aeration or anything. Uh, this is becoming more popular as uh, we have to collect more and more of what comes out of the greenhouse. So if you're, if you're a big greenhouse operation, you may already have a collection pond where the effluent goes into the collection pond and you allow, this, uh, you allow it to uh, evaporate uh, and then you collect the, the, that, you, that, the leftover minerals and do something with them. There are more and more places where you can't release that back into the water supply. So ebb and flow, you can use the water over and over again, and you have to monitor the nutrients and add a little bit of this or add a little bit of that when you need to, okay? And I think we have some of these out in the greenhouse, don't we? I think Dr. Reed, well, maybe he used to have some. Drip, of course, is very, very popular. Um, drip is, depending on who you talk to, if you're doing this in a container, then some people consider this a, a, this form this kind of this system a kind of hydroponics. Uh, if, if you did an overview of hydroponics, it would probably be growing plants without soil. <coughs> and in drip systems, if you're talking about in a greenhouse or whatever, you're usually not you're usually using a artificial media. If any of you know Dr. King, he used to be in a faculty. He run, he grows greenhouse tomatoes. Um, and they're, they're on a drip system, and he has, he was, he was using a new one, I don't know if he's still using it, but it was a long cloth bag filled with something, and you'd just sort of uh, put a slit in the bag and put the seedling in there, and, and the point is the water is still going in by drips, but you don't have to worry about air. That's a big thing is you don't have to worry, you do not want a system where you have to add oxygen. And, uh, I don't know if he's using that now or not. Aeroponics. When I was in Washington State, they had trees that were growing, had been growing aeroponically for probably since the 60s or so. So you'd go down into the basement and there was this massive room full of roots, tree roots. And the solution is missed it. Uh, the only other place I've ever seen this was in Disney World Epcot Center. Um, this is not, this can be used commercially and in the Epcot Center what they had in the top of the greenhouse, anybody been there lately? They, still have, they, had, they had plants moving on a conveyor and the plants would move through this misting area so as the plant came in it would be misted, the roots would be misted with a mineral solution. That way you could grow plants in the top part of your greenhouse which is not uncommon because you've got more than enough light. And then, oh, got a minute here. Okay, let's go ahead and stop there. We're almost out of time. <clears throat>